everyone. A big welcome back to the Nick Elston Show Season 5, Episode 6. And we're flying along this season with an amazing guest to bring you. I did promise you wonderful guests. And I brought you all the way from Ireland. I have the amazing Emma Weaver. Give it up. (laughs) Emma, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you very much. That's a great introduction. (laughs) Well, I try. (laughs) Uh, It's really great to have you on. We kind of got introduced for a friend of the show, Sean Doherty, who was on last season. Um, He spoke very highly of you. I've heard good things about you. So usually Sean's opinion is is a good one to trust, I've found, in life. Um, so that's a really cool thing. And actually, it's one of the silver linings of the past couple of years. It's really broadened our network of people that we've come into contact with. Um, so Emma, tell us who you are, where you're from and what you do. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely amazing. So thank you. Um, so I'm from Ireland. I live in a small county in Ireland. I um, have three beautiful children. I'm very proud of them. They're my biggest achievement. I'm sure a lot of people say that, but they truly are. And um, I have worked in mental health for, I manage mental health services for over 23 years across the Western Trust where I live. And then um, last year I went out on my own, took a big brave step and went out on my own and established Mental Wealth yes. International because I feel there needs to be a bit of a change up in how we how we structure things and how we deal with the issues that everybody's dealing with without getting too heavy into it i believe we just need a different perspective maybe and a different way of doing things so yeah that's that's what i'm at now i love the vibe and i love the meaning behind mental wealth as well it's uh it's very powerful i see what you did there (laughs) i see what i did there i see it's a whole different um idea of it and genre around when we're talking about wellness and well-being mm. but let's talk about the wealth let's talk about growth and achieving and establishing as opposed to always trying to fix ah mm. oh, yeah i mean that's the first rabbit hole we can go down for sure <laughs> there are two main reactions to to people that are struggling with poor mental health or even mental illness that um we either try and fix them or we go the other way and keep them at arm's length because it just seems a little bit too much to get involved with. And like you said, somewhere in the middle is the truth, isn't it? And and I certainly found from my own experiences that the the most negative impact of of struggling with your mental health generally actually is how we, how it affects living a life on our terms, having a business on our terms, having a career on our terms. It's, It's how it keeps us in our comfort zones, I guess, right? A hundred percent. And people's expectations or even, you know, their thoughts around it, it's so different. And I, you know what, I'm delighted that you said mental health and mental illness, because there is a difference. Of course, yeah. there is. There is a difference. And people kind of forget that. So I suppose I go down the road of mental health and wellness. And one of the things that I truly believe, and I learned this in all those years um, working in mental health. And again, like I was managing different services. Yeah. And I recognized instead of always expecting people to reach out, when you need support, we need to reach in. We, we need to be there. We need to create that culture that it's already there. Because I know if you're not feeling that yourself, you don't want to reach out. And people are like, we need to talk about it. We do need to talk about it, but we need to think of it a wee bit differently because it's not working. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is why it's so important to make that kind of distinction between yeah. mental health and mental illness. I guess, and this is a huge subject, of course, but mm-hmm. I think the way I kind of try to see it is is mental health being more of a something like a muscle, something that we can influence and nurture and nourish and care for yes. every day, even if it's in between periods of medication, therapy, counselling, help, mm-hmm. whatever you need, because we all know the access to those services is uh, is drawn out at, at best, um, if near on impossible, sadly. Um, but mental illness is a million miles away, and, and again haven't experienced both of those extremes for me that's the foundation of changing the culture is actually using the term mental health respectfully it's a it's a neutral state isn't it 
Yeah, and you know what? You've just described that so perfectly. And it's great to be able to have a conversation around that and really embrace that there is a difference, but also talk about you don't have to become unwell or be unwell to be looking after your mental health. And that's why we're trying to create um, an idea about being mentally wealthy at all times. And then whenever triggers do occur, other struggles in your life, or there's incidents or whatever, if you are already working on maintaining your well-being, being, then you potentially don't hit the wall at as fast a pace as you would if you weren't already doing some of those things. Mm -hmm. And again, it's by changing mindset and culture around what what we term as as mental health. And one of the things that I am terribly passionate about is realizing that your mental health and well being is equally, if not more, so important. This bold statement than your physical well being. You, you know, it's, you, yeah. it's very hard to have one without the other, believe it or not, and there's huge correlation. So it's definitely right there, parallel, if not more so. Yeah, absolutely. And ha have you found things kind of like flying your own journey as opposed to working within the structures of an organisation? It's completely you know, more, different. I was going to say, there's, there's more freedom, but with that comes a lot of, yeah. kind of scariness yeah. as well too. There's, it's, it is scary. Um, um, I don't believe it stops being scary it depends I suppose <laughs> on what you're doing I feel um because obviously I had all that experience behind me it wasn't necessarily something that I intended to do last year so quickly even though Mental Wealth International was already established I was kind of brought to a situation and I thought it's one of those sliding door moments you either go mm -hmm. this way or that way and I chose to go out on my own which has been absolutely amazing but what I really like about it to be honest with you is there's none of that red tape per se where I am allowed to to voice what I believe based on my experience, qualifications, knowledge, all of that. And, you know, very factual based as well. And um, I am now able to reach out more. So so the construction industry, believe it or not, has really embraced mental wealth. They have really thought, you know, we really need to be doing this. So we go in and do different things like mental health first aid and workshops and stuff like that. That they may not have been so, and I'm saying may not because I don't know. This is just a broad statement. Um, about coming into maybe one of the bigger firms or being part of a different organization because of the the turn of phrase changing the health to wealth and believing then that it's for everybody and not just those people that um feel unwell from time to time it's about everybody embracing it and one of the biggest things is i'm able to go in and have those really deep rooted conversations it's not so structured you're able to have it and i think that's that's the missing piece maybe sometimes there's no agenda it's genuinely there to right let's talk about this let's see what we can do about it or how it impacts people and make a change and create that culture going forward yeah absolutely i mean it's certainly a sector which has its unique challenges i think last time i checked about 92 percent male workforce all the challenges that come with that with high rates of suicide attached to that as well mm -hmm. so it's certainly a sector which is crying out for a different approach yes. And, and, and that's just one that's sorry nick that's just yeah. one uh, for instance that i'm giving you in terms of if i still had been where i was that maybe may never have been approached it's just something that has happened from going yeah. out on my own and and people seeing the value in it yeah and i, I think it's the, the like you said it's the terminology as well i mean i've even been but to speak at events and for context i'm not solution focused so yeah. i don't coach or train or anything like that yeah. I'll leave that stuff to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. My my sole ambition is to is my sole focus is to increase engagement in the initiatives they got already, or kind of gap analyze what they're missing. Like I said, people like yourself that are doing great things from the coaching uh, kind of perspective. But I mean, I can remember quite vividly like being told to go and speak at this event without mentioning the word burnout because they kind of felt by calling it into existence it would happen. I said, this is here already. It's a really weird thing. We, we're trying to we're trying to reduce the stigma, reduce the taboo kind of element, but then we're telling you don't use particular words. Um, and I think certainly as a generalism, construction is up there as one of those kind of industries, that last bastion of traditional business in that sense, yeah. um, in a in what can be quite a, an alpha primal environment, especially on a construction construction site level. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. Um, it, it's tough, surely. Yeah, statistically, um, the Lighthouse, I think, brought the statistics out. Um, it's two construction workers a day complete suicide it, in the UK. It's huge. Wow. It's absolutely huge. And that's a very sobering 
statistic when you take it on and it's one that I would use obviously when I'm out and about talking just to get people to know and you know we definitely do say we need to talk about this we need to talk about it and I agree we need to talk about it but talking alone doesn't necessarily work in a male dominated environment so we mm. need to think different we need to do things a, a little bit differently and it's about finding out what works in different circumstances and different environments and it's certainly not one size fits all and I hope that's what what I achieve and my team achieves whenever we do because that's the idea yeah you know it's, it's very what works for you because what might work for you may not work for me We're, everybody's just so individual in the circumstances and it's about seeing the person yeah absolutely and I agree and it's I think that's far too much of, of, of that kind of encouraging people to to open up and talk about stuff and there's a reason you don't find me on twitter or, or facebook yeah. or on social media generally we're, we're trying to create a culture where we're, we're encouraging people to open up but then we're not catching them with any solution yes. even inspiration a lot of the time and that's the interest yes i exactly. agree and, and that's why i believe and and that's why ethically and morally if my role isn't there to be the solution actually it's to make sure that i signpost other people the two because you you kind of my role is to so seeds of lots of questions. Your role is to go in and be that solution. And I, I like that, that, that element. So I won't leave anybody hanging at that point, but there's so much of that going on. Yeah. Or the element from the organizer's point of view that I bring you in to talk about this stuff. And then it's kind of like a tick box, kind of quick fix kind of thing. But it's like going to the gym once and trying to get fit. It doesn't happen. I tried it. Trust me. It <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. I tried it too. <laughs> now, I know you, you look, it's important to say you work in lots of different organizations yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It's just exclusively construction. Yeah, that, that was just one I threw out right there yeah. in terms of had I have stayed where I was, that may never have happened. It's like, I mean, I exactly. work in tech and all different organizations. That's just a for instance. Yeah, exactly. But it's a great example of, of an extremes within organizations. Yeah. You also mentioned about gyms as well. Is that, again, is that an experience thing or is that just something you fell into? Or? So I recognise, and, you know, when I used to go to the gym to, rigorously every week, uh, maybe not so much now, but I definitely recognise that the two are, are correlation. You can't have one without the other. You can't be physically well without being mentally and emotionally well. And mm. I think you need to be mentally and emotionally well to be physically well. I think the two marry together and the gyms have really embraced it. And whilst they'll be talking, people will be talking about mindset and I'm big into mindset. I read a lot. I do a lot on my own mind. It's also about wellness and well-being and marrying your, your physical well-being and your emotional well-being together. And, um, one of the things as a female, and I'm sure males say this too, but I can only speak from my own experience, emotional eating. You know, mm -hmm. so when the emotional triggers, you're heading for the food and there is a correlation between that. And that's where the gym comes into it as well. So finding out. So if you go to PT, they want to know what you're eating, your calorie intake, all of that there to, to get you as fit as you can be and to that optimum level. But your emotional well-being has to come into play there as well. Yeah. So I know locally and further afield here across Ireland, gyms have really embraced um, mental wealth in terms of recognising that it's important to to look after both yeah. whenever you're trying to achieve that that optimum state of physical well-being. Yeah, agree. I was going to give you a really weird high five when you said emotional eating. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I, it's all triggers and as well. So one of the very important things, and and you know, we talk about it all the time. You need to know yourself. You need to go in and without getting too deep into it, but you need to recognize really who you are, what you like, what you don't like, your triggers, mm -hmm. and deal with that scary stuff that we don't want to deal with. If you want to really show up your best self, and it's not easy to do no it's not and actually that really resonates with me I, I love the crossover of kind of how we we talk about things already i'm loving this conversation i could tell there's a second episode coming already so um, <laughs> but I, I talk about like the battery if you're a battery you 10 out of 10 fully charged one out of 10 running on fumes and let's face it i don't wake up every morning feeling 10 out of 10 nowhere near most of the time to be fair but knowing what elements get me to as close as i can to that yeah. Uh, th those bits around kind of recovery, recharging, like you said, very different for very mm -hmm. different things. But essentially, it's the questions that people sometimes are quite afraid to ask of themselves. It's what nourishes you, what depletes you, who nourishes you, who yes. depletes you, and then picking those elements that actually go into into your life. 
there is a perception when people look at you and they look at me that we're talking about kind of mental wellness in different ways, but there's a perception of like, hallelujah, these guys are cured. And in my case, absolutely not. I manage my crap daily to varying degrees of success. Yeah. The difference is there's a difference between speaking about this stuff and taking your own advice. Yes. <laughs> it's and, huge. And I still very much use the stage as therapy space, which kind of makes a lot of people quite nervous sometimes, but yeah. just kind of verbalizing what's going through my head. So actually it feels more real and I can... I can kind of kick it around with a live audience. And I love that element of it. Yeah. And it's really important to bring up these topics and speak about these things in all different ways mm. and in all different environments and genres. It's And that's the brilliant part of it because people resonate in different ways. Mm. Like some people like to read things. Some people like to listen to things. Some people like to see things. So it's about making sure that it's available to everybody. Yeah. And like, I, consistency is key if I'm honest with you and it's not easy to be consistent in anything at all but you know it's that 80 20 you know if you're able to show up I say show up for yourself because do it for yourself and I don't mean when I'm talking about showing up for yourself I don't mean you have to attend every event or you have to do all those things if you're not feeling it that day show up for yourself set the boundaries in yourself and do or don't do it you know find the balance yeah but um and that's how I know Sean who's introduced me to you. I do his five five five. It's like I mean, every morning, seven o'clock, get up, do the five five five. My day, I've already I do a book club before, so I maybe already started my day, but I'm jumping into that feeling better. And you know how I know it works? Because when I don't do it for a while, I don't feel at myself. Mm. So something different works for everybody. So yeah. and how you know that it's working is because when you stop doing it and you start to kind of feel a wee bit not at yourself, you know then, right, I need to get back into that again. So it's about trial and error as well, because it's different. Like people will be like, you get up at half five in the morning. Now, I don't do it every morning, but that's what works for me some days. That's OK, but you have to find your fit, but try as best you can to do it consistently as much as you can. And that's how you know it works. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really strong message. And I, thank you for sharing that. I, I think also there's that kind of element of finding something that you can either emotionally connect to in a positive way, or you can, well, let's face it, just enjoy doing as well. I mean, yeah. I use the example of traditional kind of gym work. It felt like a chore going, but I could easily get up and go swimming every morning, which I do, um, because I want to do that. I, I enjoy doing that. And that means I was I am consistent in that. Yes. And that's the difference, isn't it? It's trying to find something that, that kind of sweet spot, which you're doing the thing that's really good for you. What I found was I was doing it on the weekdays originally. It comes to Saturday or Sunday morning. I felt really kind of like jaded because I wasn't doing it. So I started going on the weekend as well. <laughs> and it's I like that. But again, that's where self-awareness comes into play. Yeah. Was, like you said, it's knowing yourself and knowing that even on two different days, something that could be really good for you today may actually be a negative distraction tomorrow um i use the example because i've done a, a bit of work in the space around gaming so if you have a few hours gaming that could be really good for me on one day but then if i'm using it to block out any other stuff that's not a good thing so same exercise two different yeah. reactions we're kind of screwed as humans really aren't we all these, <laughs> all these kind of <laughs> but it really are. is um yeah. you know and we're busy people the most of the time we're busy people and it's about showing you know it's about understanding as much as you can understand really what makes you take what works for you setting those boundaries and i say this to people all the time um and i know it's a wee bit out of context maybe about what we're talking about but it's in and around boundaries no is an answer you don't have to explain yourself to other people and that's one of my self-care tips mm. <laughs> do you know because when you're saying yes to all these other things what are you saying no to are you saying no to yourself are you saying no to another commitment so ask yourself that question you know in your in your head or internally you know when you're saying yes to all these things what are you saying no to and no is an answer it doesn't need to be no but or no because or anything like that but again that's about kind of knowing how you feel about things and and setting those boundaries which i would have found particularly hard years ago but i've worked on it a lot and i'm getting there <laughs> it is difficult isn't it i think when you when you're struggling with your mental health generally i think you become naturally become more subservient to more dominant people dominant situations or events or 
you fall into that. I mean, I found that the people pleasing was a fantastically effective mechanism. It's utterly destructive, but fantastically effective. Yeah. It's hard to say no to people sometimes, isn't it? And yeah. But like you said, absolutely crucial. Um, and you kind of know people got this kind of imprint of you, this kind of blueprint of how you should be in life. And when you start to say yeah. no to people, it kind of shakes our world up a little bit. Yes. A guest of the show, I had Brad Burton, who was the founder of Four Network in early on in the seasons. He was saying about the snow globe effect. It's when you start to make these changes and change how you are and view somebody else, you need to give them a little bit of time to see how you are and to engage with you on your terms again. It's, it's an interesting one, that one. I think it's difficult for people to say no sometimes, if, especially if they're struggling with life a little bit. A hundred percent. And that's why it's so important to to talk about it and kind of people really need to give themselves permission to know because if it's causing unnecessary stress or anxiety, maybe no is the best answer. I'm not saying say no to everything. Say yes to everything that you can. That is what life is all about. Mm. Embracing it and trying new things. But it's about understanding that, that no is an answer as well, because I find quite often with people that I be talking to, sometimes that's one of the most effective things that they can do is, is to kind of protect themselves and, and you know, use that yeah. as a self-care mechanism. And it feeds back into that comfort zone thing. And if, if people are kind of listening to this or watching this thinking, well, comfort zones aren't, aren't a bad thing, right? The absolutely terrible thing that... <laughs> Toxic relationships or comfort zones is easier to stay in a position of pain and frustration and it's to do something about it. And it's, I think that's really difficult and that kind of feeds into that kind of element of feeling quite numb in our existence without getting really, really deep on this stuff. But I know from my own experience of of experiencing kind of breakdown, the, the worst thing wasn't feeling pain or, or anger per se. It was feeling nothing at all because... Yeah. To cut off feeling hate, you cut off feeling love, to cut off feeling bad, you cut off feeling good. You can't have one without the other. So you end up living in this kind of like numbness. And I think that for me is the risk that we run. If we yeah. if we continually and if we're not living a life on our terms, then whose terms are we doing this on? That's right. That's a scary question, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? And that's huge. I yeah. mean, we could start to kind of decipher and pick at that for a long time. <laughs> and it's huge. So it's, I know, and I'm going to use this word, finding the balance, and nobody ever has the balance on everything. But it is about making sure, you know, and I do often say as well, setting goals is so important in life because that's, we are human beings. We are goal setting creatures. So it's, Small goals, big goals, whatever it is, we need to be constantly doing that. And, you know, in all the years that I would have worked and even talking with some of the teams that I would have worked with, I, we definitely, in team meetings and all, we definitely would have recognised that some days, sometimes people getting up, making their bed and making it in to see us is a, a big thing to do. And it's about yeah, recognising yeah. that and, and acknowledging it and saying, and then building from there. And that's what it's all about as well. So setting goals, no matter how big or small they are, um, the ripple effect that that can have on people's well-being and their lives is huge. It's immeasurable. I can't even begin to, you know, they don't have to be, you don't have to be saying you're going to take over the world or <laughs> you're going to build a big massive business and do all this. Whatever it is, it's important to do it and achieve it because the ripple effect that then something else and something else and how you feel and celebrating it is huge. It, it is. It changes everything, doesn't it? It changes yeah. your, your narrative, your outlook and everything else. And you can even reprogram this. We'll get really deep if we went in this. You can, <laughs> I and I know you'd understand this, that we reprogram ourselves when we change yes. our narrative and, and start to think about these things. And But you physically do. Your brain then starts, mm. like it's a muscle, you know, you, it, it changes everything. So it does, yes. you're right. It reprograms everything. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And I always find it amazing why, why kind of two people sat in the same room, one could be really struggling with anxiety, for example, and one doesn't one seeing danger everywhere one isn't same room same temperature same people same environment same everything two absolutely different experiences of life yeah and that blows my mind <laughs> that the fact that that perception is very often created and compounded by the way that we're feeling about ourselves yes and it's the whole nature nurture as well, isn't it? It all depends on where you're coming from and what brought you to that moment. Mm. And that's why it's so important to realise, 
um, that it's not one size fits all, that we need to see people as people, as individuals and who they are and change the narrative and things and create a different culture around all of this. And it's the only way really going forward. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I mean, you spoke about goals and stuff and, and, do you think over the past couple of years through the pandemic and, and obviously other big global events that mm. we just seem to have kind of like stumbled from one disaster into the next over the past few years? Have you seen people's um, ability to create goals or to aspire dampened or limited by the the kind of even the expe- um, expectation of the unexpected now, really, isn't it? We, yeah. we never know what's around the corner. So a lot of people seem to have been pushed back into survival mode. So are you truly being heard in life and in business? And think about that genuinely. If the answer to that is no, then you've found the right event. If you want to give yourself that boost personally and professionally, come along to find your voice live. This is will change your life. This will be the game changer that you've been looking for. It provides me with the confidence in myself to prove to myself that I can do it, I can get up on stage, I can speak. There's absolutely nothing to be nervous about with these events. It's very, very open, very, very relaxed. Help my confidence go from here at the beginning of the day to here at the end of the day. Hey everyone, my name is Nick Elston. I'm an inspirational speaker on the lived experience of mental health and a transformational speaking coach. I'm the founder of Forging People and Find Your Voice Live is our flagship event where we cross the boundaries of personal development, mental health, transformation and public speaking. Your ability to speak to deliver any message to any audience with clarity and power and emotion will have an ultimately defining impact on your success by your own definition of that really subjective term. Speaking is life, speaking is business, speaking is education, and that's the thing that we focus on most. What I find is that people are here for many, many different reasons. Some people do absolutely want to be a stage speaker, a professional speaker. Some people want to be able to represent their business uh, or to lead a team or inspire a movement or create a story. But even actually, some people want to be here just because they want to feel they want to be heard at home. Maybe they they don't feel their opinions being heard, that they can't say yes to the things they want to say yes to or no to the things they want to say no to. Again, this is where personal development meets mental health, meets public speaking to create a real positive impact. At the end of Find Your Voice Live, you will walk away with massive confidence around delivering your message. The ability to stand up and deliver means you will enhance your self-esteem in an amazing way. You will also have the skills and tools and tips and techniques to not only deliver a presentation, but to structure a presentation, to find your audience, to be able to deliver emotional storytelling to help your audience feel and make them want to be part of your tribe, make them want to be part of their, your following and really tune into what you're truly about, to truly make yourself heard in life and in business. If you're sat on the fence, if you're still not sure, take the model that I use, say yes, worry about it later, and I'll make sure that you're looked after brilliantly. Myself and my team will make sure that you have an amazing day, a transformational day, that will have the desired positive impact that you want to achieve. Yeah, it's it's definitely changed us all one way or another. I don't really know anybody that wasn't impacted. In fact, I don't know anybody that didn't at least have one, two, maybe three of those hitting the wall days and just that mm. came out of nowhere and they'd never experienced those feelings before in their life and they were thinking, what is going on? But we were in extreme circumstances, um, to be fair. And what I seen was maybe two different things. Either people set all new goals, restructured the whole life and went that way. Or yep. other people thought, you know, I'm kind of liking this pullback, this easier way of going, and maybe not so much going to push all these things ahead. So people kind of either went one way or the other. And um, whenever it hit, to be honest with you, I still, we worked all through it because obviously we were mental health, we were frontline workers. But in the evenings I sat, believe it or not, and wrote a book. And there's no way on this earth that I was thinking, I'm going to write a book. And um, and that's what happened. And I went out there and it was quite successful and things like that. But people just took different things out of it. And I also believe that people that had never experienced any sort of issues or any sort of mental health issues or became unaware of themselves were quite shocked or quite aware of how quickly it can happen. 
mm. or, or how it nobody is adverse to this it uh, you know it's everybody um can be impacted so i think people people either went one way or the other you either like i mean my business then was set up during the pandemic and then i don't know other people that had businesses that went you know life's just not that's just not my thing anymore and they've pulled way back and just took a whole different approach to life so it that. really just depends and how was the experience of writing a book tell us about the book oh gosh um i had no intentions to be honest with you so my sister said to me so um i went through i done a ted talk on ivf so i oh, spoke fantastic. about ivf and um so the book kind of came out just before it or it was being spoke about and that's then why I was asked to do that so I wrote the book I started the book and I got to a certain point in it and it, uh, I just I put it back down close it and pushed it to the side and says right I'm not doing this so I must have got maybe about 20,000 words in and thought no I'm not doing this and um, you could feel it it was quite a heavy topic so Whenever um, the dreaded word of lockdown hit, second weekend, I just lifted the, the pages. I actually wrote it. I lifted the pages back out again, thought, right, I'm going to finish it. And I sat under my stairs. Now, I, I could have done any room in the house. It didn't matter. could have been sitting here. It didn't matter. I sat like Harry Potter in under my stairs. <laughs> that was my comfort zone. And I have photographs of me. And um, I finished the book. Wow. I think it's actually... It's, two years this month from it was released and that's just by coincidence we're talking about it and because of the subject matter and me being me I talk about all the things that nobody wants to talk about <laughs> and nobody really it talks is. about IVF and the impact that it has on people and mm -hmm. um, it's actually done quite well it opened up conversations it opened you know it allowed for people to come forward I now do kind of talks on it and just really talk about creating conversations around something that people potentially know a lot about that's amazing. And genuinely, genuinely, even just today, in the calls I've had today, um, IVF and fertility has come up twice. Wow. And it's, it's not spoken about. Amazing. Oh. So I'm really glad you shared that because now I have yeah. somebody to point them to. Yeah. <laughs> to do for so, sure. And also so, the talk, obviously, <laughs> on one leg. And it makes sense to people because people don't realise, people think IVF is just very medical. It's far from it there's so much more to it so oh. if you know me you know i'll talk about all the things and that's one of the things <laughs> good for you i love that and i'm glad you are I, i'm glad you're out there doing that and all the links by the way i will repeat this before the end but all the links to emma's stuff videos books websites whatever you want will be in the bio and i do strongly suggest you connect with emma i'm sure she'd be really happy to hear from you as well if you have any questions and stuff but yeah. um Okay, so we've gone straight to what you, where, where you are now, what you're doing now. Tell us about Little Emma and growing up okay. in, and your journey to where you are today. Okay, so um, Little Emma is the second child of six. So there was three girls came first and three boys came after. And a little interesting fact in our house is the three girls came first is a blonde brunette and a redhead. And then the three boys that came after were a blonde brunette and a redhead. I have no idea, but look. Like the production line that. thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love telling people that. It's just a wee fact that nobody may ever know. But um, yeah, we were um, reared in the countryside, very much country living, lots of fields, ran about, made up games in our heads. There was no technology <laughs> at that time. I um, went through school, didn't love it, didn't hate it, very kind of in between. Um, I got pre I fell in love. I got pregnant quite young. I had my first daughter when I was 17 and um, it was hard. I put myself through college then, so I took a year out and I had good support and I put myself through college and that's how I got into um it was like social care and and into mental health so um my daughter's dad unfortunately then was hit in a motorbike accident when she was five so there was a lot of adversity and a lot of growing up and a lot of understanding of how precious life is and not to be taken for granted when I was very young so I was 21 years ago. So I'm giving away my age a wee bit there if mm -hmm. people want to work it out. So then I went on and put myself through college and um, kind of I went on a work placement one day and that's how I got into mental health and just loved it. And the first time I walked into the room, because people do quite often say, what is it in the background? When I walked into the room and I was quite young. I was probably about 22 when this happened. I was out in placement and I walked into a room full of people and realised 
it's someone's mum, someone's dad, someone's uncle, sister, brother, auntie, cousin. These were all just people that lived in the community that were getting off their lives that needed just an extra bit of support with their well-being and their mental health. And for some reason, that just struck me. And I thought, right. And, and that's how I got involved and kind of worked my way up then into management. And I would have worked on other different projects. Like I would have worked with the probation board. I would have done some work with older people's services, learned disabilities and loved it. Absolutely. I mean, embraced it. So I have three children now, as I said at the start, I'm very lucky. I've got two boys and a girl. And yet life is just rolling. Um, I don't know, is it when you get older, you start to embrace it a wee bit more. You don't sweat small stuff and you kind of just get on with it. So I am definitely enjoying life now. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. And and thank you for sharing such clarity as well. It was great to follow your journey along there. Um, mm. Tell us about your, tell us about your first speaking engagement. Oh, gosh, that's probably quite a while ago. And my first speaking engagement would have been around adversity and leadership. Okay. So um, it's quite a while ago, somebody recognised me in one of the articles I wrote, it was something to do at work, and um, it was a local event, and I got up and just spoke about um, the traits. It was actually in the college that I went to, they asked me to come in and talk to the students that I would have been maybe 20 years before, or 15 years before, and talk about leadership and adversity and how you don't always have to go down a certain route. Yep. You can kind of go around a windy road where you need to be. And um, that's that's what I spoke about. I spoke about you know, the younger Emma, as I've done with yourself, and my journey through um, my educational journey and then where how I got into the position. Obviously, it was a different position then to, to challenge young people to understand that, that it doesn't have to be a straight road. There's, yeah. different, there's different avenues and ways of still getting to the end result that you want to be without being too hard on yourself. And that's, that, that's, gosh, that's quite a while ago. That's what I spoke about. <laughs> Well, given that Harvard consider public speaking a greater fear than death, I'm always kind of interested to hear kind of professional speakers as you are now, um, kind of their first experiences of this. Or did, yeah. So does speaking come naturally to you or is it something that you've kind of harnessed that anxiety, those nerves over I the years? I think, um, I can't remember being, I was nervous. I, I can't remember feeling that whole anxiety because obviously I was speaking about a journey that I knew a lot about. Mm. And so what I do now, believe it or not, I'm actually the the creator, curator of TEDx in a skillin. So I now oh, create fantastic. TEDx speakers here. I've nice. got the license in in a skillin. So it's funny you should ask that because you probably didn't know that before you were going on this. So I done a, an exercise one time with a lady called Cleona O'Hara and it's called the Seven Eleven Steep. And it talks to you trying to find your why. So you do the Seven Eleven Steep. So it's like, why do you do what you do? And why and why and why? And obviously the kids come in there, you want them to have a better life and know a different way. But my base level why is I want to support other people to have a voice because there was the time in my life that I felt I couldn't use my voice. And see when I realised that, I was like, oh, where did that come out of? Because I, you know, and I was doing this in front of other people. So it makes sense, really, that I do what I do in terms of even Mental Wealth International, creating those cultures, giving people a voice in those arenas, as well as now creating speakers mm. on what's potentially the most prestigious platform in the world, if you're into TED Talks at all. And now creating that, so you see how it all aligns, but in two completely different ways. <laughs> exactly. um, so I now coach or support speakers to to stand on that red dot. And believe you me, that it's a piece of red carpet. It but it's one of the most intimidating things you will ever oh, do. Absolutely. I mean, uh, so the uh, the event that hopefully we're going to meet at in September, my Find Your Voice event, we use the red cross, but <gasps> it's it's really interesting because my my ambition isn't isn't to get them to a pro stage per se which yeah. is interesting mine is for the the transformation through speaking is the is the thing and that's why i love the the synergy you when you were chatting today get me goosebumps because in the spirit of honesty you mentioned things like fertility that i don't have children actually and the way that i create legacy is by helping other people to find the platform that I did through speaking to create change. And um, 
so again that synergy is great because you take that to a different level and help them to go pro in that sense as well love that yeah. that's really cool yeah and what was your it's experience? all part of the journey you know it's all it like, so, and, and, and it did another you, thing yeah genuinely totally. when, when you were saying about kind of that was your your why that kind of that's how mine boiled down as well i yeah. mean this 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 meeting was meant to be it's <laughs> quite obviously <laughs> so, um, how was your experience of doing a ted talk so um i got like six weeks uh, notice i got asked would i do it because um nobody was talking about ivf so it was like um we'll talk about it and um I got, I did, I got coaching from a lady called Camilla and um, I, again, so um, the TED Talk is an idea worth spreading. So it's really about what your idea is opposed to really who you are or what you do or anything like that. And I really, I really drill into that. And that is how my event runs as well. And my event was Be the Change. And it's more about what your message is. And I mean, it was, you know, really well received. So my talk was on, IVF and the journey and be kind to everyone you meet because you never know what anybody is going through because we didn't tell anybody so and that was really my message but I the experience because it was live and um, it it was scary now and um, I am fortunate enough and not everybody's got different ways and strategies of presenting a talk and that's just and I, I know that and I knew it then but I certainly know it now just even with the speakers that I have um, put through but I'm very structured so I knew what I wanted to say I kind of memorized the first and last paragraphs like memorize them word for word and the middle I kind of had it structured in my head so I didn't do too badly that way so I knew to put in some and everybody's so different I put in you know some quotes I put in some you know theory around it and information and then just talked a wee bit about my journey Mm. which is easy to do when it's your journey because it's your journey you know yeah, um absolutely. it was hard to do because it was hard to do because i was talking about such a sensitive thing you know and i knew my family were watching and they may not have had a clue about any of it you know i really put it out there but it has created change people have reached out and i went okay you know People have reached out and said, no, nobody knows. I'm and I'm like, I know what you mean. And it's just creating conversations. And that's what I like to do, create conversations, reach out to the support. Like yourself, if somebody needs support and I can't do it, I, you know, signpost them on wherever they need to go. However, I believe one of the greatest gifts that you can give to anybody is your time. Mm. Gift your time. Sometimes people just need you to hold space for them. Yeah, Absolutely. I like that. That's good. <laughs> so, what's next? Ooh, so what's next for me is um, obviously Mental Wealth International going forward. It's about creating those cultures in um, whatever sector or workplace that it is. It's huge. Mm -hmm. I am also part of a mastermind, a co-facilitator mastermind, um, which is amazing to see younger or smaller maybe businesses mm -hmm. excel. So giving people that voice, giving people that platform, that's really just starting to take off. So that's quite exciting. So I imagine the end of this year and 2023 is going to be big for that. And then I'm also heading to um, Australia at the end of the month to a women in business conference. It's the Osmopreneurs and it's going to be amazing. And Fantastic. that is something I've never done before. That's a biggie. And I'm scared. I'm not the most keen flyer in the world, <laughs> but um, I'll face my fears and do it anyway, which I encourage most people to do on a daily basis. If you're going to do it, go big, eh? Oh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> so I, I guess the, 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 the penultimate question I want to ask you is this. Um, you are consistently working, helping other people. Um, how do you recharge yourself when you need to bring your energy back in? Yeah. So how I do that, and it's not rocket science, it's quite easy to do. I um, found my love for reading during lockdown. And I mean, nice, easy books, not heavy books at all. And um, like, I mean, we have the book club 
we started a book club and um, it's, it's all female. It's just happened to be like that. And even the vibe I get off that and we're talking about books and silly stuff and all that. But that recharges me. Mm. See, in the days that I do that, I have the best days because that <laughs> has kind of filled my cup before the day even starts. Um, definitely, I like writing as well. And I do, I meditate every day and that's just my thing so i either do it in silence or i listen to something or just give myself a wee bit of time and i do that before the kids get up because that's the only time but i gift myself that time that's the only time that i'm able to do that and that again is where people find what works for you Mm. you know and that's just the only way i can do it to be honest with you so that's really and it doesn't it's not highfalutin in my life it's really just consistently doing that see when I don't do those things I know right okay and you're missing that because we were even talking about not doing the book club during the summer and about two weeks in we were like let get back onto book club (laughs) (laughs) I miss it no you're absolutely I said the same with the podcast season four and you ended about three weeks ago I said it'll kick back off in September and I thought screw it I'm gonna do it now (laughs) (laughs) I miss having these conversations it's amazing Um, thank you so much for sharing that and for everything else as well. And to repeat, please do connect with Emma. All of the links are stuff in the bio. Um, so the question I'd like to ask everybody that comes on the show, uh, and it's usually a little bit easier when it comes to professional speakers because they got they kind of know this stuff, but it's okay. going to form the basis of a playlist at the end of season five. But I am now the MC of the O2 Arena in London. 20,000 people have paid their hard-earned money to come and hear you speak. You're sat back in the green room sipping a Prosecco or a tipple of your choice. And you hear me announce you and your walk-on music beats in. That song that motivates you, that lifts you, that gets you at peak state. Emma Weaver, what would your walk-on track be and why? My walk-on track would be Titanium by David Guetta because that is my go-to song when I need it. Every time without fail, that's my song. That's a great tune. I'm so pleased that's going to be on the playlist. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So from me to you, Emma Weaver, big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Round of applause to you for having these conversations. <laughs> so glad we met and our worlds have collided. Uh, and that's going to be the first of many times. So I hope everybody else has enjoyed the show as much as I have. Again, please do reach out to Emma. She will be very happy to hear from you. Um, and for everybody else, please stay tuned uh, for next Monday's episode. Another amazing speaker uh, to bring you. Uh, I think it's a bigger, yeah, a speaker to bring you. And uh, episodes are list in my head. Uh, so next Monday, stay tuned, hit subscribe and like and all that jazz. You know I'm not a details guy. Whatever it takes to get you here next Monday, <laughs> do that. Uh, and in the meantime, be well, stay happy and take care. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.